Tired of waiting for Winds of Winter? Still feeling unsatisfied from Game of Thrones Season 8? Need a fix of medieval political manoeuvring? Then boy do I have the series for you. One trip to America and I'm already sounding like an infomercial. The Accursed King series by Maurice Duron, because Accursed has three syllables, apparently. Made up of seven books starting with The Iron King, published in 1955, the series details the downfall of the Capetian kings of France during the 14th century, and the subsequent build-up to the Hundred Years' War with England. As its subject matter strongly suggests, the series is historical fiction, not fantasy. But as George R. R. Martin admits in the foreword to every book, Historical fiction and fantasy are like sisters, two genres separated by birth. Martin goes on to praise the series as the original Game of Thrones. If you think the Starks and Lannisters have beef, believe me they've got nothing on the Capets and Plantagenets. Once you start reading the series, it's easy to understand this comparison. The Accursed Kings is full of egomaniacal characters pushing for their own political advancement, with consequences that affect an entire nation. It has powerful queens, weak kings, family rivalries, battles, betrayal, sex, scandal, and murder. Not so much magic, but there are curses and cultists, witches, potions, and poisons that lean into the mystifying elements of the medieval age, where the lines between sorcery and science were blurred. And the best part is, all of it actually happened. Well, mostly. Mostly. The novels are historically accurate considering the information that has survived the last 600 years. These make up the key locations on our journey back through time. But I think it's safe to say where there are gaps in the history, Dron takes us on the most dramatic route possible. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The first novel, The Iron King, takes place during the aftermath of the persecution of the Templars. Quick history lesson, the Knights Templar were a military order born out of the First Crusade. Despite the Franks capturing Jerusalem in 1099, the neighbouring regions still remained dangerous to Christian visitors. In 1119, a French knight, Hughes de Payens, pitched the idea of creating a monistic order to protect pilgrims visiting the Holy Land. In the following two centuries, the Knights Templar became increasingly wealthy and influential. But as their power grew, so did the number of people indebted to them. One of these figures was King Philip IV of France, who on Friday the 13th of October 1307 ordered the arrest of multiple Templars. The knights were tortured into admitting heresy, and the order was disbanded by Pope Clement V. You might be thinking that's a lot of drama to have skipped over before the series even starts, but believe me, history is just warming up. Let's talk about the characters, because this is where the series really shines for me. When discussing historical characters, it's easy to think of black and white textbooks that we read in school that turned people into nothing but a series of dates and events. But Duron successfully adds colour to the 14th century French court. This isn't a history textbook. These characters are flesh and blood, full of passion, ambition, fear, doubt, courage, and quite often, callousness and it's pretty obvious who the author's favourite character is. Robert of Artois, a giant of a nobleman who is as strong as he is cunning. Think Gregor Clegane, but with Tywin Lannister's brain. A pretty OP combination if you ask me. Robert's selfish attempts to win back his inheritance are what kickstart the series, and as more and more powerful people get pulled in by the gravity of his schemes, what starts off as a family dispute quickly snowballs into a war between countries. I say spoilers, but you know, history. One of the elements I enjoyed most while reading the series was the number of great female characters. Isabella, the she-wolf of France, is a more competent Cersei Lannister, the Countess Mahou of Artois is a real-life Queen of Thorns, and the beautiful yet charitable Clements of Hungary could easily be an inspiration for Marjorie Tyrell. Drawn does a brilliant job of portraying how easily the course of history is influenced by the whims and actions of individuals. Kings and queens and those closest to the royal circle have an advantage in this respect, but sometimes fate picks a plebeian to play an important role. Which brings me to my favourite character, Guccio Bologna. Nephew of a Lombard banker, fate's hand seemingly plucked Guccio from his simple life of money lending and debt collection and drop him right into the heart of royal affairs in France. 
delivering messages to the Queen of England, sneaking into a conclave to force the election of a pope, and winning the heart of a noble girl high above his station. And that's a good segue to talking about the romance. Now I'm not usually a fan of romantic subplots in fantasy books, unless we're talking about Shallan and Kaladin, or Rand and Avienda, or Dean and Castiel. Anyway, no romance story has ever gripped me as much as that of Guccio Bologna and Mary Cressy. Guccio plays the part of the hero, rich and wealthy, often called upon to rescue Marie's family who have fallen on hard times, but despite the destitute state of their chateau, the nobles are far too proud to invite a lowly Lombard to join their family. It's a classic Romeo and Juliet tale of forbidden love, and is, if possible, even more tragic. And unfortunately, this romance subplot brings me to my one criticism of the series. The ending. The first six novels were published between 1955 and 1960, but the last book, A King Without a Kingdom, was published 17 years later in 1977. And as you can probably guess, it's… different. Whereas the first six books jumped between different character POVs and put us right into the heart of the action, the seventh book is entirely narrated by one cardinal who is travelling through war-ravaged France recounting events that have taken place in court and on the battlefield. This makes for a slow-paced and very disappointing end to the series. Honestly, I struggled to finish this one, and the book, originally written in French, wasn't even translated into English until many, many years after its publication, and the hesitation is understandable. I'm going to talk about some small spoilers at the end, so if this video has convinced you to start the series, and you want everything to be a surprise, then I would skip ahead to the timecode on screen now. And also, don't look up any of the characters on Wikipedia. At the end of the sixth book, history compels the author to kill off his favourite character. Drawn writes in the third person, the pen, as the old chroniclers say, falls from his hand and he has no desire to continue. As touching as this is, this left many plots unfinished, and one of them was the tragic love story between Guccio and Marie. Towards the end of the third book, The Poisoned Crown, my favourite by the way, the two lovers are separated, but the author promises us that they'll meet once more in ten years' time but we never get to read that reunion. I'm not sure what the opposite to catharsis is, but that's how the ending to this series made me feel. I demand satisfaction! Oh. The author does pick up the pen again to summarise the fate of key characters over a couple of chapters, but it feels very rushed and takes the audience out of the realm of historical fiction and back into the black and white history textbook. With all that said, I have gone back and reread the series several times, and it still keeps me gripped with great characters, intriguing storylines, emotional highs, and heartbreaking lows. The most heartbreaking low is the ending, but that's not enough to ruin the rest. As the Knights Radiant would say, journey before destination. I really recommend the Accursed King series to anyone who loves history, or fantasy, or is just sick and tired of waiting for the winds of winter and wants to give the real Game of Thrones a go. Let me know in the comments if you've read the series and what you thought of it, or if this video has convinced you to pick up a copy of The Iron King. Secretly, I'm just trying to draw attention to these books so that when I pitch an adaptation to a TV studio, they'll give it the green light. And you best believe I've got plans for the ending. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you in the next one.